This is my first time doing this talk, so it's kind of a bit of beta testing my thinking around this, so I'd love to get your feedback. Um, I've just come back from Canberra where I was speaking at a conference to the glam sector, galleries, libraries, art galleries, and museums, and they had me talking about why games matter, which for me as a game designer, why are we still talking about this? But that's okay, it was really great kind of like, um, chance to advocate for games and why they matter. Um, and so what I talked about there is games are still a bad word, and that was why they had me come and talk about this, because games are still a bad word. Um, we just had the WHO declare that there's a thing called gaming disorder, which I could do a whole other talk on, but yes, there is some problems with games, but like with any other media form, there's so much more to it, and I think it's just kind of throw the baby out with the bath, with the bathwater, which is what we don't want to do because this is what when I so I spend a lot of time advocating for games in Western Australia, this is what happens is that we think of games as Grand Theft Auto, right? So I'll have conversations with people in charge and it's like, oh yeah, my son does that and I really wish he would stop doing it and that's the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is is we need playfulness more than ever. I was at a school um, that I went to actually briefly. I'm secretly a Kiwi, a Kiwi with a strange accent. So I went to, New to school in New Zealand briefly um, when I was about five, and I went back when I was visiting my relatives to see what they'd done, and they had actually taken two hours out of, well, they took their computer lab and turned it into a um, maker space, and they'd also took two hours out of the morning, every morning, to take structured, uh, structured curriculum time out and replace it with teaching kids how to play because apparently they don't know how to play anymore which is blows my mind but i think maybe is partially linked to the whole games and play is a waste of time i think also probably has to do with helicopter parenting and all sorts of other things again this is probably another talk but we actually need playfulness more than ever um and i'll come back to the, to, to this but basically playfulness is being connected to all of these important skills that we need for for the future so some context first before I get to that um, so this is a surprising number um, and you know unfortunately we still measure things by like how much they're worth economically um, but games are bigger than music and film combined right so it's massive um, so from that perspective like we can't ignore games as a thing um, the other thing too is that when I tell people I'm a game designer Again, they think, oh, I make things like Grand Theft Auto. I actually don't make video games. I make, I guess what would be described as uh, mixed reality games, like weird physical world games, which I'll talk a bit about in a sec. But um, yeah, more, so games are, games are important. Games are um, huge, and there also can be more than just video games. So an example of that um, is a game called Gentrification, the game that I created with uh, an art collective um, back in 2010 now. Um, and it was shown, we showed it all around the world. Um, it was shown as part of the Toronto International Film Fest, the National Theatre in London, and it won um, Best Use of Technology and Best in Show at Come Out and Play in Brooklyn. And the reason that I'm really proud of the Best Use of Technology is that this is what the game looked like. There was very little technology in it, which is kind of the point um, because the first game I, I ever made actually was here in Perth and it was when Bluetooth was first becoming a thing and the client was like, we want a Bluetooth game and it ended up being the worst game I ever made <laughs> um, and failed miserably, but was really useful in, in rethinking about my design philosophy, which is to focus on the experience first. And there was a little bit of technology in this, but it was added in after based on play testing and we found that we needed to add it in. So it was really added in um, as, as needed rather than kind of being the driving force. But it was basically um, a game where you were either, it's kind of like live action monopoly and you're either the local team trying to save the neighborhood or the developer team trying to develop and turn everything into a Starbucks. So the cool thing about it is you actually had to do the thing that you wanted to do. So this is, um, a PR campaign that the um, developers had to do where they actually had to go and give people flowers and candy and then you could actually protest as the um, the neighborhood team um, by having a ridiculous absurdist protest and this was just meant to be kind of like a fun space activation game um, but it kind of gets you thinking about what you can do in terms of games for engagement and games beyond the screen um, which is what I want to talk about next so um, I did a, a, an escape room. How many people have heard of escape rooms? OK, 
Okay, cool. So a few people. Um, you can do them here in Perth. They're basically you pay money to get locked in a room and have to solve a series of puzzles to get out. So um, I did a customized one that was ran, ran for three days for the State Library of Western Australia. And it was a bit different than a one that you would go into, a, um, like the ones that are kind of run as a business here. It was a, like a bespoke um, art artisanal um, escape room, <laughs> I guess. But the point of it was is the library wanted to have different people come into the library to engage with the library's materials in a different way. So getting new people in and in having a new way of engaging. So usually escape rooms are kind of based on like a murder mystery or um, a shipwreck or something like that. But what we did is instead of having it be based on that, we based it on Western Australian stories that were pulled from the collection and used artifacts from the collection. And we created a series of puzzle boxes that were about these different stories. So there were three different stories and three different puzzle boxes, and it looked like this. Um, and it was actually played in the library for three days. And um, the story was told through a bunch of different media artifacts. So the WA stories, but then also through like DVDs, because even though it's an old technology, it's, you can find a DVD and put it into something and you have this really interesting experience. So what I'm really interested in now and I think kind of brings a few of the strands, so as well as doing um, game design, I'm also doing work supporting young people and preparing for the future because I was sort of a, an accidental early adopter of the future of work in that when I was growing up, what I do now didn't exist. There no, one, no one could advise me on what I was going to be doing, and that gave me a huge amount of existential angst. So now I think everybody's going through this. It's like, you know, what, how do I prepare for a job that's not, that's not going to exist or when everything's going to be automated? So bringing together um, sort of game design and how do we prepare for the future, um, yeah, again, with stats like this, right? I think it's, I heard it's now actually going to be 60%. I think they've updated this. This is from CETA in 2015. Um, but the thing is, is that we can't automate creativity, emotional intelligence, problem solving, and change making yet. Although it'd be interesting to see a, an activist robot. Maybe that'd be a thing. I don't know. Um, and so coming back to games, I'm not really a fan of Barbie, but they did a really good job of game designer Barbie, which came out maybe two years ago. In that, um, in the back of the box, it tells you about all of the cool things that are involved in game design. So it's actually this great little, like, um, uh, Advocate, advocate for games, right? So it's like you can see that it encompasses STEAM, right? So science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and entrepreneurship, and all of those other things. And it's not just about coding, right? So I really kind of like this as a little advocate for games. But you can see how in either um, learning about making games or making games, um, you can, there's actually all these transferable skills that you can either bring from other areas or um, learn from making games. So it's a really kind of great entry point to get young people interested in this stuff and you can teach all of these things through game design. So um, a project that I just finished, this is my only, I just first time ever talked about it this week at the, the conference in um, Canberra. So this is my second time talking about this really um, cool project that I worked on with the city of Stirling, um, their Epic Tales program. So this was um, during the school holidays program. And it's an experiment in what if we actually use not just games to teach, but actually the creation of games to teach. And so this project was a little bit ambitious in that it was a six day project. First three days was like hackathon style, let's actually create a game with 15 teenagers. And then immediately after, second three days was actually let's run the game for the public. What could go wrong? <laughs> Surprisingly, actually nothing. Um, and the game was sold out before we even started making it, which no pressure at all. Um, so it was an escape room um, that, yes, yeah, so escape room co-created by kids. <laughs> yeah, it was a very interesting project. Um, and so the story was, um, there was an, the, the kind of, um, the catalog system of the library became sentient and was an AI mm -hmm. and was getting bored and decided that it wanted to get rid of all of the librarians because they were inefficient. So um, the interface with that was this chatbot. So um, we got to take turns playing the chatbot and you could print stuff out. We'd print out things to give to the players. Surprisingly, that's just this really magical experience to be sitting in front of a computer and all of a sudden it starts printing files for you to look at. Um, so that, there's that, and then the, um, the librarians were, um, you basically are trying to decide, are you going to side with the AI or are you going to decide with the librarians? And how we divided up um, assigning 
because one of the challenges was how do you actually meaningful, meaningfully create an escape room with kids in three days, knowing that you actually have to run something that's actually fun for the public to play. So the idea that I came up with was um, we had four lockers, and each locker has a different librarian and a different story and a different puzzle track in it. So we had four teams of kids who were each responsible for one of the lockers. And what they had to do was their puzzle track inside of it. So if you've played a, an escape room, you know that there's like one puzzle leads to the next. So that's a bit of a challenge in how do you get 15 kids to come together and make that work. And what we just said is you're, you're responsible for making a puzzle track that fits in that locker. And then at the end, you have to spit out a four-digit code. And that connects to the next. And so that was the way that we connected that. Um, but that, there's these, you could, these are two of the lockers. You could see um, how kind of that story and the puzzles started playing out through that and combined with the, the chat bot. So the interesting thing was that we, um, I spent a lot of time answering questions from parents who thought this was going to be a coding workshop. This is what it looked like. There was very little coding in it, and that was deliberate, again, because it's games are about teaching all of the things like that game designer Barbie says that they're about. Um, we did have coding um, as part of it for the kids who were interested, but it was largely um, working together, teamwork, um, analog, storytelling, stuff on paper, um, using, um, making clues and artifacts. So they created everything that was in those escape rooms, in the, in the puzzle box, not the puzzle box, it's the, the lockers. They created all of that. Um, and they helped to kind of map out how that would actually um, work. And um, so this is some of the, the technical side of, st so, so Steve Barrick, who works with PVI Collective, um, he was involved as well, um, doing like some of the, ch the, the chatbot was all custom coded, so he, um, some of the kids were interested in that, and he did a bit of um, work with them around that. So it was kind of engaging them in whatever their interests were and seeing that there was something for everybody. And then at the end, we did play testing, um, and so this is where we took their the lockers and tested it all. Very little stuff that actually had to be changed. They worked really well, the stuff that they designed. I think kids are natural natural game players and game creators. So this is a really valuable experience as well. Um, I've been talking to schools about the challenge that they have in creating um, when they, they want to um, get kids thinking about startups and solving problems, they have trouble thinking like what it's what problems might be for adults. And if you use games, what game, that, so that if you rethink it in terms of making a, not making a product but making a game, um, kids can get their head around that and they can still get the experience of okay, we're going to have someone else play the game, we're going to see what that's like. It's so that kind of iterative beta testing. They get that experience without having to like think like an adult. So it's kind of potentially a scaffold that can be used. Um, to actually get kids to think about um, doing kind of um, social enterprise or startups. Um, so yeah, so it was a really, really valuable experience. Um, and then this was when we actually ran the game. Um, so this is outside. It was in the library, and we kind of themed it in the library because it made sense and worked with what we had. And so we had this other um, kind of on the other side of the divider wall where we had the control center. And so the kids also were involved in, in running that. And so they got to be involved in every aspect of, of the game, which I think was really, really valuable. Um, and then what was surprising to me was that some of the feedback we got was it was um, largely about working with other people. So apparently another thing is that kids are having trouble with social interaction and social skills. So it wasn't just about teaching critical thinking and creativity and innovation, but it was also te um, teaching basically like how to work together, which was a surprising result, but actually was quite kind of inspiring to me about what where this could go. So this is a bit of a pilot um, to try and bring together these different things that I'm working on. So I hopefully have blown your mind a bit about what games can be. <laughs> um, and that's it. So thank you very much. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions for okay. Kate. Um, if we have questions that would like to be posed. Have you tried it with parents? Have I tried escape rooms with parents? Yeah. Um, so the one for the, for the state library was for all ages, so it was most, uh, mostly adults. And when we ran it for, um, at, here at the American Buco Library, it was for all ages as well, so it was parents and their kids who played it. But we haven't run that workshop for parents specifically. I think we should talk to John. <laughs> that would be a great, a great fun. Okay, so a question for you, Kate. Yes. People, please take note of the answers. Oh, yeah, that's mine. Um, imagine it's now 2035, uh -huh. <laughs> and um, you're looking back, and you're looking at the innovations, practices, and trends that are now shaping 
the new economy in WA. Could you imagine that and tell us what these new practices and innovations and trends are? Okay, I think I'm going to mainly focus on the practices. So I just did um, a wrap to speaking tour for the Australian Computer Society that was about the future of all the things for ICT folks, but it was really actually about um, playfulness, creativity, and diversity. So it's kind of a sneaky way um, for me to get IT folks thinking about this stuff. Um, but I think those are the three things that are really, really important. Um, playfulness, obviously, for my, what I've talked about today. Um, so actually, did I say creativity? So it's, not, it's playfulness, diversity, and empathy, actually, and compassion were the three. So um, diversity is really important as well because there's a lot of research that actually shows that diversity is strongly linked with innovation. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that is. Um, but it's largely if the problem we have right now, especially around technology, is that we have a very small homogenous group of people in Silicon Valley creating products that are being used by everybody. And if we look at what's just happening with Facebook, that's exactly why we have a problem. So um, creating some products and technologies that everybody can use um, I think that's really, really important as well. And, and compassion and empathy is the last one. Um, and I think that just kind of overarches all of those other things. Um, because I, I, I just can't imagine a future that, or a positive future where we're not being compassionate and caring. And I think that's probably why we're having a lot of problems today because we're not really focusing on that as a value. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's what I would imagine is the three principles that I think are really important. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks.